The book of Acts is Dr. Luke's second great manuscript, the Gospel of Luke being his first compilation. So you could just as rightly call Acts to Luke or Luke part two. The book titles are not inspired. By word count, Luke is the most prolific of the New Testament writers. Luke wrote approximately 27% of the words of the New Testament. Paul wrote approximately 23%. Together, these two men wrote approximately half the New Testament. By word count, Luke and Acts are respectively the longest and third longest books in the New Testament. Some have speculated these two lengthy Luke documents were meticulously compiled by Luke to form part of Paul's legal defence in Rome. I strongly favour this theory. We know that Paul had appealed to Rome, and at the end of Acts, he's finally in Rome, awaiting for a Roman ruling and hearing to decide about the accusations made against him. Luke Volume 2, or Acts, starts off right where Luke 24 ends, with the ascension of Jesus. Luke completed Acts in the early AD 60s. The history recorded covers a 30-year period, from the ascension of Jesus to Paul's second-year Roman house arrest, ending in AD 62. Let's get straight to our text. Acts chapter 1 verse 1. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Luke starts this account by immediately referring to what we call the Gospel of Luke. Clearly, this account was made intending to be part two of his detailed evidentiary documentation regarding the life and times of Jesus and his disciples. Part one, or the Gospel of Luke was Luke's meticulous autopsy of Jesus' life and times. Luke had carefully interviewed all the eyewitnesses he could. He read any available writings, as recorded by the eyewitnesses. At the start of his Gospel, he refers to Theophilus by the honorific Most Excellent, suggesting Theophilus, whose Greek name means Friend of God, was a Gentile man of high office. For context, the honorific most excellent is used in Acts 23 when the Roman governor Felix was being formally greeted by letter. So Theophilus, friend of God, is clearly a man of position and power, and this important document, delivered to a man of standing, has been wonderfully preserved for us to learn from and be uplifted by. Verse 2, until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So we learn in these verses that Jesus remained with the disciples for 40 days after his resurrection. During these 40 days, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Jesus gave commands to the apostles. Jesus had spent three plus years teaching them daily, working with them, admonishing them, instructing them, being an example to them. Then after they were scattered, broken, defeated, without hope, upon seeing Jesus arrested, beaten, crucified, and buried, Jesus spent 40 days commanding, strengthening, and rebuilding their faith. My experience of life has shown me tough times, trials and tribulations, tragedy and trauma can either break you or make you. The Bible is full of examples of broken and shattered people who either were destroyed and lost or were remade by the power of God and came back stronger and more full of faith, hope, strength, and love. Of the twelve broken apostles, one was destroyed and was plunged into a lost eternity. The remaining eleven ultimately became filled with the Holy Spirit and were used mightily of God. Luke's witness is clear. 
the dead and crucified Jesus came back to life. There's hope for the hopeless. Jesus presented himself to the 11 and many others, living, breathing, walking, talking, eating, alive. Jesus was no hallucination. He was no dream. He was no vision. He came back from the dead. Some people have laughingly attempted to claim they had a lookalike killed in Jesus' place. And Jesus' mother stood by the cross, watching a son die, so brokenhearted, either playing the greatest acting role in history, or she herself didn't recognise the counterfeit look-alike. What nonsense. Others have proposed that Jesus didn't die, but simply fainted and fooled the Romans into believing he was dead. But the Romans confirmed his death by thrusting a spear through his side, causing a great gush of bodily fluid and blood to pour out. They would stretch credulity by having us believe the Romans incompetently let a man condemned to death escape with his life. When a Roman centurion and his men were given a man to execute via crucifixion, 100% of the time that man died. The Roman guards would not step down till the man was dead. They were hard men, expert executioners. For 40 days, Jesus presented himself to small and large groups, instructing with urgency things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Only the resurrection of Jesus makes sense of the disciples' willingness to go to their deaths, clinging to the truth of his rising. Plenty have died being tricked by a lie. But these apostles and many others were willing to die to uphold their witness. They saw the risen Lord. This 40 count period is an often repeated theme through scripture, especially linked with the changing of dispensations. It rained for 40 days to conclude the antediluvian times. Moses went up to Sinai for 40 days at the giving of the law. The Hebrew spies spent 40 days searching Canaanite lands before they ultimately declined to enter the promised lands. Israel spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness before entering the land of promise. Saul, the first king of Israel, was 40 years of age when he became king and he reigned for 40 years, starting the time of the kings. Jesus fasted for 40 days in the wilderness before the start of his earthly teaching ministry. And now Jesus here in Acts taught his disciples for 40 days prior to the sending of the Holy Spirit, commencing the church dispensation. Verse 4, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. In these few verses, we have a very clear teaching of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All the cults and isms mess up the Trinity. One God, three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Both wonderfully simple and yet complex, beyond the mind of simple man to fully grasp. Here we have the Son commanding the apostles, meaning the sent ones commanding them to remain in Jerusalem, waiting for the promise of the Father, which is the coming of the Holy Spirit. Wait in Jerusalem. In not many days from now, the Holy Spirit will come. Wait, don't do, wait. Jesus refers back to John, the water baptizer, preparing the way for the coming of the Jewish Messiah. And each of us should indeed be baptized with water fully submerged in water, voluntarily, as a public profession of our faith. But this coming baptism with the Holy Spirit was a greater event, a supernatural event, a rebirth into new eternal life. To be baptised with the Holy Spirit meant a rebirth. This is what Jesus spoke with Nicodemus about, as recorded in John 3. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 6, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? You see, the disciples were 100% Jewish. 
they were waiting for God to fulfil the many promises he made to Israel. When is Israel going to be set free from Roman oppression? When will Israel have lasting peace? Jesus, when are you going to assume your rightful throne? This is what they meant by restoring the kingdom to Israel. It's worth noting, through Acts, Israel is mentioned 20 times. The word church is mentioned 19 times. It's undeniable Israel and the church existed simultaneously as two distinct groups right through the book of Acts. Verse 7, And he, that is Jesus, said to them, I'm not going to restore the kingdom to Israel. I'm setting up a new body called the church, and the church will replace Israel. Is that what you read in your Bibles? <laughs> of course not. How Jesus actually replied to them was, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. In other words, the restoring of the kingdom to Israel will happen when the Father is ready. It'll happen when he's ready to make it happen. He has assigned a time and an appropriate season for this to occur. And I'm not releasing the Father's timeline of events. This is not knowledge I'm giving to you disciples today. There's not the slightest hint or doubt in this recorded conversation that God didn't intend to restore the kingdom to Israel. In fact, it's not till near the end of the first century that God gives the timeline of events to John in the Great Apocalypse. Not providing us with a date, but certainly giving a season for that great event. The book of Revelation also expressly states a 1,000 year period during which the kingdom will be restored to Israel in its first stage. Then it seems this kingdom will extend on into eternity, fulfilling the repeated eternal nature of his promises to Israel and Abraham. 73 times the word Israel is written in the New Testament. I believe every single time it's talking of actual descendants of Jacob. There are only two to three times of these 73 mentions, even the liberal amillennial camp attempt to allegorize and change Israel to mean the church. Verse 8, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Forget your focus on the earthly kingdom of Israel. That day is for a distant future time. Jesus wanted their focus on the more immediate things, the receiving of heavenly power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. The role of the Holy Spirit alters with this change of dispensations. In all prior dispensations, the Holy Spirit came upon a person to fulfill a certain task or mission. Once the task was completed, the Holy Spirit would depart. In this new coming era, about to begin, the role of the Holy Spirit will change. Soon after Jesus departs, he's telling them he'll send the Holy Spirit to permanently dwell in the hearts of Christ followers. Permanent Holy Spirit indwelling, a new birth, a rebirth, a new creation, new and permanent power and authority. Your primary role is is not in administering the return of the earthly kingdom to Israel. It's to act as witnesses and disciple makers of Jesus, starting at Jerusalem, then all Judea, then Samaria, and on to the ends of the earth. And this gives us a threefold division of Acts. Jerusalem, chapters 1 to 7, Judea and Samaria, chapters 8 to 12, to the ends of the earth, chapters 13 through 28, and continuing on until today. In the Gospels, love is one of the prominent words and themes. It appears over 100 times through the four Gospels. Interestingly, the word love never appears once in the book of Acts. But the Holy Spirit is mentioned over 50 times, and power is mentioned about 10 times. Holy Spirit power, as we have here in verse 8. A common theme, the operative term through the book of Acts. The power of the Holy Spirit working through the disciples and the apostles of Jesus. Verse 9. Now when he had spoken these things, 
while they watched, who was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. The exact location of his ascension is not known. I often picture this occurring at the peak of the Mount of Olives. But from the scant scriptural details, he appears to ascend between the mountain top and Bethany, a small town on the eastern slopes of the Mount of Olives. Jesus just took off into heaven. Elijah is described as ascending in a fiery chariot. There's no mention of a chariot with Jesus, though the text doesn't exclude a chariot departure. <laughs> the description is very basic, as are parallel texts. He was taken up and a cloud received him and then he was gone. I think the Holy Spirit has intentionally blurred the exact location of his birth, crucifixion, burial and ascension. Though we're uncertain of these locations, people today venerate approximations of these sites. If we knew for certain, imagine the extent of the crazed idolatry. Verse 10. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Two angels snapped the Galilean disciples from their gaping awe. Show's over, men. There's work to be done. Stop gazing up into heaven. He left from the Mount of Olives. These two angels confirm Zechariah 14. Jesus' second coming location is the Mount of Olives. Verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. 2,000 cubits, or 1.2 kilometres, from the city wall. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room, where they were staying, Peter, James, John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women of Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. They entered an upper room, Maybe the same place where they observed Passover, maybe not. The 11 apostles, the leading women, and the half-brothers of Jesus, maybe 25 or so people, gathered for one purpose and of one common mind, a continuation of their worship, prayer, and thanksgiving to God. I think over their entire 2,000 cubit journey, they were praising and glorifying God for the things they'd seen. There was an excitement in their faith. An understandable energy, electricity, joy overflowing. Don't ever let your faith dim to a low fading ember. This is why we need to be regularly in fellowship with godly brothers and sisters. To be encouraged, lifted up, built up, emboldened. Continuing to stay close to our first love, which is Christ Jesus, and the hope and peace we have in him. Just imagine the fellowship in this upper room. It was glorious to be on the mount, but it was wonderful to be in that prayer meeting. Verse 15, and in those days, that is, in the 10-day interval between the ascension and Pentecost, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was about 120. It really is quite sad to hear this number of faithful saints was only about 120 souls. This was the true believing, faithful core of Jesus' ministry. Sure, there were others who believed and followed Jesus, but of all the masses who followed him, only a tiny remnant, 120, were steadfast believers. And Peter said, verse 16, Men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke before by the mouth of David, concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered with us and obtained a part in this ministry. Of all the things they had in common to give praise and glory to God about, this one dark, ugly truth was a stain upon their group. No doubt people were whispering and speaking of it. The unbelievable betrayal of Judas, the guide, the coordinator, the conspirator of the arrest of Jesus. So Peter, not yet having the Holy Spirit, 
and without the direct guidance of Jesus, feels the need to say something and do something to address this elephant in the room. How often well-intending men have stood to say something or do something at a difficult moment, even though they haven't the slightest inkling what God would have them do or say. My advice, if you're facing a dramatic moment in your congregation, if you're not sure, don't rush to speak. Don't rush to do. Try shutting your mouth. Try doing nothing in the moment. Try waiting on the Lord, unless you're confident what you're about to do or say is honouring to Christ. Peter is about to make a huge decision. I think he's about to make a bad decision in his rush to be seen as a leader. If Jesus wanted to immediately replace Judas, he would have done so in the 40 days he was with them. Verse 18, Now this man purchased a field with the wages of iniquity. And falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his entrails gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem, so that field is called in their own language, Akel Dharma, that is, field of blood. These two verses have become the centre of much controversy for those who hate the Bible. People who come to the Bible with hostile intent will rarely find the truth, but rather locate apparent contradictions. Hostile readers of this scripture ask, did Judas purchase the field? Or did the priest purchase it with the blood money Judas threw back at them? They ask with condescension, did Judas hang himself as elsewhere described? Or did he die as Peter here describes? All you have to do is set your intelligent mind to the task of unwrapping these apparent contradictions. I'm quite sure every person listening could reconstruct a scenario where all the above apparent contradictions comfortably piece together into one cohesive narrative. I don't have the answers, but some possibilities to get you thinking. Maybe Judas had his eyes on a plot of land. Maybe he paid a deposit, and the priest used the 30 pieces of silver to complete the purchase. Maybe Judas hanged himself in the field he was purchasing. And during the earthquake at Jesus' crucifixion, the branch snapped and his lifeless body fell headlong and he burst open on jagged rock, his entrails gushing out. Or maybe as they cut down his body, his body fell and burst open. Verse 20. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his dwelling place be desolate and let no one live in it and let another take his office. Peter applies these two psalms, 69 and 109, to Judas. I really don't know what to make of how he applies these psalms. And I certainly have a huge question mark over his actions in seeking to fulfil these psalms. Remember, Jesus isn't guiding them. Neither do they have the presence of the Holy Spirit. Jesus told them to wait in Jerusalem for him to send his Holy Spirit. But Peter just can't hold himself back. Like so many leaders in churches I see today, men who feel they have to act, lead, speak and command, acting without the leading of the Spirit. And this is what Peter does here. He gives a teaching on Psalm 109 and Psalm 69, then takes matters into his own hands to choose a replacement for Judas. Verse 21, Therefore, of those men who had accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John to that day, when he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. It's Peter who determines the replacement of Judas has to be one who witnessed the entirety of Jesus' three years of ministry. A reasonable criteria but not affirmed by either Jesus or the Holy Spirit. When we read the book of Acts, we must understand this is a record of things which happened. It's not a letter of instruction. So we'll discover many things recorded in Acts are not necessarily of God. This man given criteria for an apostle is a classic example of this. We know for certain Jesus called Saul to be an apostle and Saul was not around to witness the earthly ministry of Christ, 
and Saul was definitely not there to see the ascension of Jesus on the Mount of Olives. So what at first glance seems like a reasonable set of replacement criteria for the 12th apostle, misses the main ingredient of apostleship, the personal choosing of Jesus. These are Jesus' 12 apostles, not Peter's. We also have the first mention of the word witness in Acts. This is another common theme of Acts, to witness. We get the English word martyr, from the original Greek. Eleven times witness or martyr is used by Luke through Acts. I've also noticed a growing trend today for high-profile, famous, charismatic men to claim the title apostle. No longer satisfied with the title pastor or minister or reverend or bishop, but daring to claim the name apostle. In simple terms, anyone sent by God is an apostle. But if someone is claiming apostle as a title, or even allowing others to call them as such, mark that man as someone to flee from. No godly man today walking in humble service to Jesus would allow others to label them an apostle. Verse 23. And they proposed two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was surnamed Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, O Lord, who know the hearts of all. Show which of these two you have chosen to take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. And they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. I'm sure both these men were good men, wonderful saints. But do I believe either of them were the replacement for Judas? Not for a second. Matthias' name is never again recorded in Scripture. We never hear from him again. I don't think the New Testament records could be much more decisive. Matthias was man's choice. Saul or Paul was Jesus' choice. Nowhere did Jesus direct his disciples to choose via the casting of lots. The 11 apostles, without instructions from Jesus and without the presence of the Holy Spirit, simply choose to apply a Levitical practice. The silence associated with Matthias's name after Acts 1 is deafening for anyone with spiritual ears to hear. Until our next study, may God richly bless you all.